Okay, so we are reading the humming effect by Jonathan Goldman. We are on page, uh, chapter eight, page number ninety-two of the book. Page hundred of the PDF. The humming hypothesis. This chapter, the culmination of our work with humming, may contain the most important and significant material in this book. In truth, we wanted to create an uncomplicated book on the subject of humming, and we hope that so far it has been relatively easy to understand and user friendly. However, as we delved more and more into the subject of the seemingly simplest of sounds, we discovered insights, connections, and far-reaching possibilities that superseded our desire to write a simple book on humming. So again, humming has a very, very phenomenal effect on the body. So understanding how that effect comes also ultimately becomes uh, important because again, awareness is the key. We were just discussing it that we need to be aware as to what we are doing with when we are doing something. In this chapter, we'll go into these more complex investigations. For some, this may be the best part. We began this book with information on the power of self-created sound, specifically humming, that came from peer-reviewed scientific research, articles, and papers. As this book progressed, we began adding more and more topics that are not particularly conventional, but that we felt were relevant, such as the concept of intent, heart-brain coherence, and quantum fields of possibilities. So these are very important, right? We were again just discussing it. Intent, how it affects the physiology, how it affects the psychology of, of our body system. Yeah. And of course, when we add intent into it, then it can it can result in manifestation. So we connect into the quantum field where all manifestation actually starts from. Now, it is our pleasure to conclude this book by speculating on some extremely powerful, though currently unproven, potential phenomena of humming. This, the vast untapped transformational potential underlying humming, is our forward-looking humming hypothesis. What is a hypothesis? The Merriam-Webster dictionary succinctly defines a hypothesis as this, an idea or theory that is not proven, but that leads to further study or discussion. And indeed, we have found that from a scientific perspective, research has provided evidence and data for our humming hypothesis. But further study and discussion are needed. So again, experimentation, someone comes up with an idea then you keep experimenting with it, keep experimenting with it. And then when the results start becoming consistent, it becomes a theory. So it always starts with an idea, an investigation, an inquiry. Okay, so that's what a hypothesis is all about. As was suggested by the scientist, we mentioned in our last chapter, a series of anecdotes is data. On one level, this was meant as a joke. On another level, he was being quite serious. So what does this mean? That someone is ref just making a comment. Okay. Now there can be no, f no smoke without fire. So if someone makes a comment and then many people start making that same comment, that thing comment becomes true because it becomes ingrained into the belief system. So as soon as something gets ingrained into the belief system and more, more and more people start getting the same results, automatically then that shifts into becoming a theory. When a phenomenon is reported again and again, eventually it comes to be seen as true. Just because a phenomenon has not yet been proven by clinical research or scientific measurement does not mean it is not true. So the, same, means... the, the same is true for let's say for Ayurveda or for uh, homeopathy. Now, if you see mainline mainline systems, or for vibrational uh, vibrational healing, or for you know energetic healing, now there's no sign. People are saying there's no scientific proof. There's no scientific proof. 
but so many people are using it and are getting benefited so now again more and more people come and use it and get benefited okay so this is what it's saying here clinically it is not research has not proven it but because the mass is accepting it it becomes accepted just because a phenomenon has not yet been proven by clinical research or scientific measurement does not mean it is not true it just means it has not yet been proven it is still in the anecdotal stage its time will come thus while some aspects of a humming hypothesis based on scientific validated to because us we believe it is true neurons and neural networks a neuron or nerve cell is an electrically excitable cell in our brain that processes and transmits information by electrical and chemical signaling neurons communicate with each other by sending impulses electrochemical signals across the small gaps or synapses between them neurons connect to each other to form neural networks each neuron has three basic parts okay so our brain has one maybe a body or so one second shimal our brains have a lot of these neurons and the neurons they get activated by stimulus which is coming in through the sensory perception as well as electrical signals as well as what we the heart is sending messages because of the pumping of the heart a wave is created and that also affects the neurons now these neurons they make connections it's very much like when in the olden days when you had to make a phone call so you had to dial the operator the operator used to put a jack into your call because the light used to light up and then he could hear you and then you said i wanted to talk to mr c so he used to take a wire connect your slot into mr c slot and ring mr c that okay mr a wants to talk to you so through that the connections were made okay in the same way when you get a stimulus a certain neuron flashes and he, they talked about the synaptic connections so the one neuron is here and the other one is here and this is called a synaptic connection in the middle so an electrical signal or an electrochemical signal passes from one neuron to the other creating a certain effect and when the neurons are blasting when they are they are they are, they are vibrating this is what causes the brain wave frequencies in the brain wave pattern which we have discussed in the mind mirror talk we have discussed always in the monroe institute talks we are talking about the brain wave patterns so the flashing and the frequency of flashing or the connections that these neurons are making this is what happens when we are talking about the brain wave frequencies cell body or soma is number 1 this main part has all the key components of the cell including the nucleus chromosomes endoplasmic reticulum ribosomes and mitochondria so all all these are parts of the nucleus now if you see a nucleus it has a brain it has a digestive system it has all the systems so the macrocosm is reflected in the microcosm each cell is a living entity in itself and it has all the functional capacities number 2 axon this lengthy cable projection carries electrochemical impulses along the length of the cell this the axon is often covered by a myelin sheath so this is like the spinal column where all the nerve cells are going okay and it is covered by a protective sheath like our spinal column is connected by the by the uh, by the vertebra of the spinal column inside the spinal column all the nerves are going which is supplying electrical information to the whole body like that in the cell if you take the picture up shivangla is there a picture in this i'm just seeing yeah angla can you put up the text she you she shared it it's there it's it's it shared it's on screen i can see her screen so the idea is she shivangla can you just point your cursor to the axons no not niche 
नीचे 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 ऑल दीज हाँ सो लाइक द ट्रेन न सो दीज आर दिस इज लाइक आर स्पाइनल कॉलम and the end the axon terminals are like the waves which are coming out or the nerves which are coming out from each vertebra into each of the uh, organs etc now when we do the life system there is a spinal program and in that we have a chart where each vertebra is connected to a certain organ or a certain aspect of our body system and it's fantastic when you just do the spinal column treatment you can get a figure as to what is working in the body and what is not working so in the same way the cell also has these axons and the synaptic connections are at the bottom the axon terminals are there and the dendrite terminals are there that is when the sparking takes place and the synaptic connections are created you have to go up again shiva Dendrites. dendrites these branch like projections of the cell receive signals from other neurons allowing the cells to communicate with each other so again how do they communicate through electrochemical signaling so that means we have the cell body or soma the axon and the dendrites Many years ago when Jonathan was engaged in a PhD program at Union Institute and University he studied the psychophysiology of sound that is how sound affects the physical emotional and mental aspects of a human being his hypothesis at the time was that just as electrical impulses are able to stimulate neurons it could be possible to use the vibrations of self created sound to stimulate neurons in order to create new neural networks and potentially regenerate damaged neurons so many times what happens if a road is not used it gets overgrown it gets broken up like that even in our brain we have these neural pathways that if we don't use them they get stale and they get destroyed so using sound it is now what his hypothesis was that using sound i can generate and start creating the spark in the neurons so that they start working again such a phenomenon would have great potential for repairing injured brain tissue with significant implications for the treatment of alzheimer's disease strokes head injuries and more today the study of neurogenesis confirms that it is indeed possible to grow, grow new neurons okay so in the in maybe about 20 years back it was thought that once you got the brain no no new growth would take place in the brain so if you see brain theory the growth of the brain you are born with many 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 neurons okay now if during the growing up period the the neural neural pathways are not used we read about this in magical child also at the age of about 6 or 7 the new neurons which are not connected to any neural pathway they get slaughtered they get kicked out okay so the neural growth growth takes place from the age of 1 to 7 then what they found was that again neural growth takes place at puberty when you fall in love or you rise in love at that time everything is possible for you you're running you're you know you're floating on clouds so what happens again at that time also neural growth takes place so they thought that only neural growth takes place at these two periods in life after that you keep losing neurons you don't grow any more neurons now having said that they found that the more you engage yourself in activities the more you learn the more you do stuff what happens is maybe no new neural cells are not getting created but the axons the dendrites and the axon terminals they grow so they are capable of connecting more and more and more so one one uh, neural cell can have multiple connections with other cells so they are part of multiple neural pathways okay so this is what he is saying over here now If, uh, to to the study neurogenesis confirmed that it is indeed possible to grow 
new neuron. So it's basically the neural growth that they are talking about. The study of the relationship between sound and neurogenesis is ongoing with several interesting twists. So now this picture is very interesting. One second, let me annotate. Why can't I annotate? Yeah. yeah, so what, what was I saying was that this is, this is a dendrite this is a synaptic connection. This is a synaptic connection of the uh, another cell. Now what happens is that an electrochemical thing is generated from here and it comes and connects over here, which sends the signal from one neural neuron to the other neuron. Okay, that is how that the, the frequency, the vibrations start coming. And that is what determines what frequency your brain is working at. So is it slow? Is it going very fast? Is it going extremely fast? So again, extremely fast is like gamma. If you're going fast, then it's beta. Then you have alpha, then you have theta, and then you have delta. Microtubule vibrations. In the early 1990s, at the Sound Colloquium, a conference for sound healers and therapists in Epping, New Hampshire, Susan Gallagher Borg, a renowned sound therapist, spoke with Jonathan about the concept of microtubules and their connection with the healing power of sound. Microtubules are fibrous, tube shaped, protein structures that help support and shape cells. However, at the time, little was known about them. So again, that melene sheath which is there in the axon which was mentioned in the previous chapter, there is not just a sheath. It is made out of fibers which are called microtubules. So it's like if you have one string, okay, it's very easy to break. But then if you have 10 strings and they roll, roll it together, there's a more strength in that. So the microtubules are actually rolling on each other. Years later, in 2014, we were sent material about a recent discovery of quantum vibrations in microtubules inside the brain. As it turns out, microtubules vibrate at incredible frequencies, 10, 10 million vibrations per second. Their vibrations are thought to be responsible for brainwave activity. And as the study authors conclude. So again, as they are vibrating, they actually create a support structure for all the cells' activities. Treating brain microtubule vibrations could benefit a host of mental, neurological, and cognitive conditions. Clinical trials of brief brain stimulation aimed at microtubule resonances with megahertz mechanical vibrations using transcranial ultrasound have shown reported improvements in mood and may prove useful against Alzheimer's disease and brain injury in the future. So creating a resonance in the microtubules can help in repairing the brain. Scientists have focused much of their work in using sound to affect brain cells in the ultrasound range, which perhaps not coincidentally vibrates in the same megahertz frequencies as microtubules. It could be that the reason scientists are finding ultrasound to be an effective tool for neurological treatments is that it synchronizes with microtubule vibrations, which could themselves possibly be the source of or contribute to brain waves. But self-created sounds like humming don't even begin to approach the incredible high frequencies of ultrasound. Is it even possible for humming to affect brain waves? We speculate that the answer is yes, based on a phenomenon known as beat frequencies. So beat frequencies is basically binaural beats, what we are using in hemisync technology. It has been suggested by Stuart Hamroff, MD, and Sir Roger Penrose, authors of an article titled Consciousness in the Universe a review of the ORC, O-R, 
theory that the microtubule vibrations interact with each other and create much slower frequencies which fall within the audible range and are called beat frequencies. Beat frequencies. According to the physics of sound, beat frequencies occur whenever two slightly different frequencies resonate together. When these two frequencies sound, they create a third frequency, which is the vibrational difference between the first two frequencies. As an example, a frequency of 100 hertz and a frequency of 110 hertz together create a third frequency, which is the difference between them, that is 10 hertz, which is called the different tone. If one frequency is directed into one ear and another slightly different frequency is directed into the opposite ear, as might happen if you were wearing headphones, the resulting different tone would also be known as the binaural beat frequency. So this is exactly what is used you in know? MEC. Exactly what is used in MEC. The term binaural refers to the process of directing independent sounds separately to the two ears of the listener. Research so this indicates is, this is that also the reason. This is also the reason why you need need stereo sound. So you hear one sound from one ear and a slightly different sound from the other ear. The term binaural refers to the process of directing independent sounds separately to the two ears of the listener. Research indicates that binaural beat frequencies can synchronize and balance the predominant lobes of the left and right hemispheres of the brain. So again, hemisphere synchronization. The left and the right side of the brain, they start working together. Perhaps most importantly, when the binaural beat frequencies are between 1 and 25 hertz, they have the ability to actually entrain with our brain waves. So what does this mean? A frequency following response. So I'm playing one beat from here, say 100 hertz from here and 110 hertz from here. A third sound, which is the difference between the two sounds, will be generated inside my cranium. And it is within the resonant frequency on which the brain can vibrate. So the brain normally is vibrating from 0.5 hertz to about 38 hertz. These are the normal, normal frequency ranges. So now when it vibrates at 10 hertz, there's a frequency following response because of resonance. Resonance is what we did it before, taking two tuning forks, hit one, bring it next to the other. If the forks are tuned to the same frequency, the other one will start to vibrate. Okay, so like that, because this 10 hertz frequency is within the vibratory range of the of the brain, both sides of the brain start to beat at 10 hertz. So that is what causes the hemisphere synchronization to start taking place. Perhaps most importantly, when the binaural beat frequencies are between 1 and 25 hertz, they have the ability to actually entrain with our brain waves. In other words, our brain waves resonate with these frequencies. This is true whether the two source frequencies are vibrating in a low range, like our example of 100 hertz and 110 hertz, producing a difference tone of 10 hertz, or in a very high range in the thousands of thousands of cycles per second or greater. The important factor is that the difference between them, the beat frequency, lies within the frequency range of our brain waves. In our next section, you will see that brain waves can operate at frequencies of up to 100 hertz. However, research of binaural beat frequencies to entrain the brain has been primarily limited to the brain wave ranges of 1 to 25 hertz. Okay, now what is happening is that with new technologies coming in, I'm going to ask uh, Bob, uh, uh, Bob to come and talk to us. Bob Holbrook, he's the innovative director of the Institute. Now with SAM technology, that is spatial angular modulation, we are able to go into 100 hertz also. So a lot of gamma is coming into the, into the, uh, into the process or into the Monroe process. 
and we are shifting now from only hemi sync into monro audio support so they are calling it mas now and what i am told is they are in actually studying and investigating up to 50 different kinds of technology using sound to affect our brain wave systems and to affect our physiology physiology so it's a very very interesting time coming up of course we've had two sam programs in india we've had event horizon and uh, uh, what was the other one conscious presence but we have not really used sam in our regular meditations etc till now the idea is that we've got enough hemi sync right now but soon we will be also shifting into sam brain waves our brain waves pulsate and oscillate at particular frequencies that can be measured in cycles per second just like sound waves there are four basic delineations of different brain wave states beta waves from 14 to 25 hertz beta waves occur in our normal waking state of consciousness beta waves are present when our focus of attention is on activities of the external world so now today if we are listening to each other if you are comprehending what shimangla is saying what i am saying and what if you are thinking and you are observing and in 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 uh, incubating what we are saying you have to have beta frequencies in your brain wave pattern okay this is what beta frequencies are now over here it says up to 25 we've seen that in the mind mirror when we are actually monitoring the brain wave patterns of people which you all have seen in the, in our experiments with the global global peace project also where you can actually see the uh, brain wave pattern of people on screen we've seen it goes up to 38 but now the 14 to 25 is the normal range when you get very anxious when you get excited that is when the higher beta frequencies start to come into play alpha waves from 8 to 13 hertz alpha waves occur when we daydream and are often associated with a state of meditation alpha waves become stronger and more regular when our eyes are closed so one way to induce alpha for a small amount of time is to close your eyes so as soon as we close our eyes we go into alpha that's why whenever you are doing anything you very when you want to cool yourself down when you want to become peaceful the simple thing and it is across the board in all cultures you close your eyes so the first thing is to close your eyes that is it stills the beta frequencies and slows them down okay but then if you keep your eyes closed again the beta can start coming up again so unless you engage in some other activity which is actually taking you into a deeper or a more relaxed state into theta and delta again the activities will start so when you close your eyes for a few moments maybe a few minutes the alpha frequencies start to get generated theta waves from 4 to 7 hertz Theta waves are found in states of high creativity and have been equated to the states of consciousness associated with, with shamanic work. Theta waves also occur in states of deep meditation and sleep. Okay, so now theta frequencies are associated with the dream state when you are sleeping. So it's light, light sleep, where you are sleeping but you are not into deep delta sleep. You are just in the dream state sleep. it is also a part where you are connecting with your subconscious so it it is a state of high creativity so in the workshops you always talk about the story of edison where he had a very uh, he had a lazy chair and he used to go and rest in that chair and he used to keep a keep a coin in his hand okay you you will never see a person sleeping with closed hands okay when you are closed hands the beta frequencies start getting activated so again the flight and fight response is activated we talked about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system over here also so the sympathetic nervous system gets activated which is very related to the beta frequencies the beta frequencies bring you into the physical the physical that as we know it now in the theta frequencies the hands relax when you are going into sleep you'll find that your hands normally open so he used to go and sleep on his chair he used to keep a coin in his hand and you see there was a metal plate below as he was going into the theta state his hand used to open the coin used to fall and he used to get up now when he get got up 
what happened was the beta free the, the theta frequencies were still there that alpha frequencies were still there and he got up so the beta frequencies also were there the beta connects it, connects us mainly with our waking consciousness so now in the waking consciousness he had access to his theta frequencies which is his deeper subconscious and the alpha acts like a bridge between the beta and the theta so you can retrieve information from your subconscious through this process through the alpha bridge and you can actually in the mind mirror see these patterns coming on on the screen okay so he says over here all shamanic work you are going into altered states of consciousness so any kind of meditative practice has to be gener theta frequencies have to be there in your brain wave pattern if you are going into altered states of consciousness delta waves from 0.5 to 3 hertz delta waves occur in states of deep sleep or unconsciousness in addition modern brain wave research indicates that a state of deep meditation can produce delta waves in conscious individuals so now when we go deeper okay we, we are going deeper so you can actually have delta and theta frequencies when you are going into a deep state of meditation the delta frequencies connect us with the universal consciousness so whenever we are going deeper we are going deeper into our into wholeness also now also what happens is that when we want to go into mystical states then we have to go into the delta frequencies because from there we get the push to go into the higher vibratory frequencies of gamma which is above the beta frequencies from 40 hertz to 100 hertz and that is where the mystical experiences take place okay so the delta frequencies and also in delta waves is where our body heals and repairs itself so many times you will find that when you go to sleep you've slept for 9 hours but when when you get up in the morning you're still tired it means that you've not got your delta sleep okay now there are many equipments which are there which can actually monitor your sleep and tell you how much sleep you're getting in which range of the sleep it's pretty fantastic just to observe it in addition there is another frequency range that has recently come into study gamma waves approximately 25 to 100 hertz these higher frequency brain waves have been found in seasoned meditators and are often associated with profound insight and deep integration of ideas or experiences so again profound mystical experiences incidentally when judith had come here to india and we had we had uh, done the uh, uh, the mind mirror mapping of many people here we found that all the people who had attended the monroe workshops their their brain was automatically normally generating gamma frequencies normally it doesn't happen with most people but each and every one of them was generating gamma frequencies as you can see most of the frequencies produced by brain waves are within the lower range of audible sound some are below this range Earlier in this book we have discussed how harmonics within the audible range have the ability to affect both infrasound and ultrasound we suggested that the harmonics of the human voice could resonate with our brain waves and that our brain waves could be entrained by our voice in much the same way binaural beat frequencies can entrain the brain okay so what are harmonics now if i'm having a Uh, having a sound played at let's say for four uh, hertz then the harmonic would be 8 hertz 12 hertz 16 hertz and so on till the end so like now in a piano you have groups of seven strings okay now if you if you click on one a all the a's will also start to vibrate because they are the harmonic of that particular a so that's how he's saying over here that using the voice we can also generate the harmonics because harmonics goes this way as well as the other way so we can actually affect our brain wave pattern because of the tendency of harmonics we suggested that the harmonics of the human voice could resonate with our brain waves and that our brain waves could be entrained by our voice in much the same way 
binaural beat frequencies can entrain the brain. Scientific evidence proves that this is true, that our self-created sounds can entrain portions of our brain and that these sounds can be beneficial for many different purposes, including stress reduction and clarity of thought. So now, if our sound is affecting our brainwave pattern and I'm highly stressed out, and the sound that is being generated through our voice is in the alpha frequency and it can entrain the brain. So the brain, if the brain starts to synchronize at an alpha frequency, then naturally the beta frequencies are no more there. So if I'm stressed out, I have to have beta frequencies. Now if the beta frequencies are not there, automatically stress reduction will take place. I'm not able to sleep. For getting sleep, I need delta frequencies. So if I can create the harmonics of delta frequencies, I will be able to sleep. So using sound, it is possible to affect our brainwave patterns. Neuroplasticity. Another interesting aspect of brain activity that has great importance with regard to a humming hypothesis is the concept of neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity means what? In the beginning, they thought that the group brain will not grow. Later on, they, now we are finding the brain grows. So now they are naming it neuroplasticity. That means the brain is plastic. It is not set. It can grow, it can shrink. Neuroscientist Paul King writes on the subject. Structural plasticity occurs when neurons grow new axons and synapses altering the structure of the neural network. The axons tunnel their way through the neural tissue like roots growing in soil until they bump into other neurons and form new synapses. So what is happening? The neural axon is growing. So it can grow up to <clears throat> maybe I think three meters inside the brain. So when the neuron is growing, naturally while it's growing, it is making new and uh, different new and new connections. So if we are doing new things, if we are constantly engaging our minds, if we are constantly engaging our brain, that is when the neural pathways start de developing. Sometimes new wiring is added during brain development and then later removed called pruning. So now this is what happens when in the, when from one to six, the neural growth is taking place and then if you are not engaging the neural pathways, then pruning starts taking place. So millions of cells get eliminated. Okay, now what is also being said, I'm taking a little bit of a diversion, that whenever you have alcohol, some of your brain cells die. And that stupor that you feel after drinking alcohol is actually caused by the death of those brain cells. This is what is being said. I've read it somewhere. I do not know whether it actually happens or not. But this is why, at least personally, I don't like to drink. I don't avoid, I, I, I mean, I, I've stopped drinking at all. You didn't drink belly bee. At a high level, neuroplasticity allows regions of the brain to reconfigure to serve new functions. For example, following a stroke, neuroplasticity allows surrounding brain tissue to take over from damaged regions. So now let us say I've had some brain trauma. Okay. Now naturally that part of the brain is dead. But when the neurons start to grow, they can start making the connections again in that part of the brain which has got affected. Every time a new memory is formed, the brain changes. If you can remember what you did yesterday, physical changes happened in the brain to store that memory and that is neuroplasticity. So again, the more experiences you have, the more stimulate, stimulation you can give to your brain, the more the neuroplasticity in the brain. Neuroplasticity is currently one of the more intriguing aspects of neurological research with many scientists quite excited about the fact that the brain can remap itself after injury. We hypothesize that the vibrations of self-created sounds such as humming could stimulate neuroplasticity in the brain, allowing new neurons to generate and new synaptic connections to form. So humming can also have this effect. 
so that's the reason why chanting was very important we again read in the uh, magical child that in some of these aboriginal cultures while the lady is pregnant she goes into an altered state and gets a song for her baby and then she is constantly humming that song over and over and over again so naturally when she is humming the vibrations of that song are going to the child now when the child is born the mother leads the entire tribe in singing the song to the child and over a period of time the child learns its own song so when we in shamanism also you are supposed to go into an altered state and find a song from your spirit helper or guide now when you sing that song or uh, uh, that vibration you can invoke that particular spirit or guide this is the same way in which our mantras also work so invocations are there you are calling in the energy of that particular entity or that particular energy using the sound of the mantra so you in inculcate that vibration into your system alzheimers and humming the concepts of microtubule vibrations and neuroplasticity seem to point in the same direction with regard to the potential use of sound to affect the brain in particular sound healing may be of benefit in cases of alzheimers research indicates that rhythmic sound playing an instrument or singing can improve clarity of mind in alzheimer patients though the effect may not be long lasting so again whatever we are doing whatever kind of treatments that we are doing we have to figure out whether it holds or not i am finding the same thing with biofield tuning again we are, biofield tuning is also based on sound now we are, when we are doing the remote treatments etc also now just now i find that the earth star sun star don't hold so we need to pull them back and at times when they hold you can actually see a physiological and a psychological difference in the way that things are happening around the client around the person who's taking the treatment other research indicates that such activities can induce relaxation which seems to have positive benefits with regard to alzheimer's okay so whenever there is an issue in our system there is stress and music can have a very relaxing effect depending again on what music there is so if i can slow down the brain wave pattern i give a chance for the repair mechanism to kick in so the repair and maintenance of the body system can take place and it's implies for the brain also recent re recent research from march 2015 has demonstrated that focused ultrasonic frequencies can gently open up the blood brain barrier and stimulate microglial cells to clear toxic beta amyloid plaques that sit between neurons and disrupt their transmissions so again whenever there is metabolism so the brain consumes i think it consumes 60 or 70% of all the energy that we are actually imbibing in our system so now whenever energy is used some kind of waste material is always generated now the waste material generally is cleared off by the pulsation of the blood when the blood brain barrier closes down and this generally happens when we go to sleep so that's why sleeping becomes very important when the clearing of the brain takes place if you don't sleep then your you become foggy your hand will start to vibrate your vision will start to blur because the brain is not functioning properly so it says over here that it stimulates now when you're you when you're singing actually the veins can start to dilate so they start becoming bigger the flow of blood in your system improves so naturally the kachra removal also improves so that's why the point here is that if i can use something to relax myself automatically healing starts to take place according to the report in mice with alzheimers like symptoms ultrasound was able to restore memory in 75% of the subjects the article said that human trials were slated to start in 2016 we find the use of ultrasound as a potential treatment of alzheimers to be extremely encouraging 
Currently, there is no known healing modality that will alleviate or cure this condition. While the use of ultrasound is only in the beginning stages of research, this treatment represents a non-pharmacological and non-invasive approach to Alzheimer's. The results are very promising. In addition, as previously noted, due to breed frequencies and other phenomena of sounds such as harmonics, it may be possible to resonate portions of the brain and achieve similar, similar results to those achieved with ultrasound using self-created audible sounds such as humming. This hypothesis may be a reason why one of the reported benefits of Brahmari humming is that it is helpful for Alzheimer's disease. So yeah, so Brahmari is helpful for Alzheimer's disease. Another article on Brahmari Pranam discusses the importance of nitric oxide generated through this yogic technique and states it potentiates immunity and senile degeneration, dementia, Alzheimer's. So again, it's when you're humming, at times you'll be able to smell a different kind of smell, okay, inside your nose. And that's that nitric, uh, nitric oxide which is getting generated. I tried to look for an instrument which could do it, you know, to measure, but I couldn't find one till now. But we'll get it at some point. It seems as if this ancient humming practice may have been observed to have positive effects on those suffering from Alzheimer's and other similar imbalances. Brain trauma and humming. Could humming, particularly humming with intent, positively affect traumatic conditions of the brain? If humming has the ability to generate, restore and rejuvenate neurons in the brain, as our hypothesis posits, this concept appears quite plausible. Unfortunately, we have only anecdotal information with regard to our hypothesis. However, we can relate numerous stories of people to whom we've suggested the use of humming after a head trauma and from whom we later received corroboration of positive results. So again, whenever research needs to be connected, it needs a lot of trials, it needs a lot of money to be thrown, it needs a lot of time and patience of people. Now, unfortunately, there is no money to be made out of humming, right? Now, if everyone can start humming and heal themselves, then the pharmaceutical industry, etc. are not going to be paid off. So naturally, no one pays money for this kind of research, which is why a lot, which is why the research does not take place, unfortunately. Stroke and humming. We don't usually talk in detail about specific cases because it seems like an invasion of privacy. But here we make an exception because the patient is a member of our family and gave us permission. Andy's mother had a stroke, a vascular stroke. Initially, she, she, she did not seem to have any noticeable after effects. But within a day or two after the stroke, we both began to become aware of a slight slurring in her speech. In fact, though she remained coherent, the slurring seemed to get progressively worse hour by hour as we talk to her. We were concerned. Okay, we so at times, at times what happens, the effect doesn't happen immediately. Slowly, 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 the effect spreads. Okay, so it, there's a residual effect also. We asked her if she would do us a favor. We asked her if she would find out from her doctor in which part of her brain the stroke had occurred and then hum for just five minutes, imagining the sound of the hum going into that area, stimulating the part of her brain that needed help. Andy's mother is a wonderful person who at the time was in her late 80s. She knew of our out of the ordinary activities working with sound and was therefore not too shocked when we asked her to do this we thought there was a good possibility that she would start humming for us. We did not, however, mention our awareness of a change in her speech, nor did we talk to her doctor. We thought her doctor might think this woman's family needed hospitalization themselves 
if they thought that humming might do anything to assist her condition. So, okay, welcome to the club. <laughs> and besides, whether or not the doctor thought the humming treatment had any possible validity, it all depended upon Andy's mother. It was she who had to do the humming. We called her the next day and there seemed to be a slight and positive change in her speech. But it was difficult to tell. The following day, we really thought something was going on. Her voice was clearer and we could understand. By the third day, her speech was back to normal. Beautiful. We are aware that Andy's mother might well have recovered her normal speech without humming as a part of the normal recovery process. We are also aware that this story is anecdotal. But we have many more stories like it of people using humming to assist with stroke and neurological disorders. We cannot help but repeat to you the concept that the plural of anecdote is data. Yes, yeah, so the anecdotes, ultimately if you have enough anecdotes, it becomes data. For those of you with family or friends who are suffering from stroke, Alzheimer's or brain trauma, we highly suggest that you do your best to encourage them to try humming as we did with Andy's mom. Check in with the medical staff, making sure they approve of this practice. But the odds are that they won't have any difficulty. Our experience is that most medical practitioners don't take the subject of humming seriously. Perhaps this book may help change their minds. So again, whenever you go with some kind of alter alternate treatment or any kind of an alternate process to the normal allopathic medical community, they just debunk it. They don't listen to it at all. Most of them. PTSD and humming. One of our great hopes has been to introduce the power of humming to veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Some research has indicated that listening to soothing music can help in reducing stress with those suffering from this disorder. Dr. George Lindenfeld, a neuropsychologist and the author of several books on PTSD, including Brain on Fire, a therapist's guide to extinguishing the flames of PTSD, has developed a procedure that uses binaural beat frequencies to successfully treat veterans with PTSD. In addition, when the specific instrumentation utilized to apply binaural beat frequencies to his clients was not available, Dr. Lindenfeld suggested that his clients hum at specific frequencies. Currently, there has not been adequate research on the use of binaural beat frequencies or self-created sound to treat PTSD to convince doctors and counselors to include these therapies in their treatment protocols. However, we trust this will change. We have worked with a number of veterans who have suffered from PTSD and have utilized humming as a means of helping alleviate their symptoms. One participant named Tony, name changed to create anonymity, has written to us asking that his experience be shared with others. In general, when I practice meditation and humming with cosmic hum, I have noticed a significant decrease in my irritability, anger, disassociation with the present moment and nightmares. So what is happening? It's causing a shift in his, con in his consciousness. The decrease in nightmares is a welcoming change as I have had nightmares and night terrors with audible screaming and thrashing for about 30 years. I do not have the same level of tranquility, clarity and rest when I neglect my humming practices and just leave it up to the meds. So it works beyond the meds. See, all these practices, they are not impringing into anything. Like hemisync will not impringe into anything. Humming will not impringe into anything. They will only enhance whatever else you're doing. Tony has now begun facilitating programs with other veterans suffering from PTSD on his own using materials we have given, given him on humming. 
we are hopeful that sometime soon humming will become a significant part of the regimen for treating PTSD. We have created a brief manual, Humming for Health, that we have made available for both clients and therapists working for PTSD. It is available for downloading from our website. Concluding thoughts. From Let's stop now. 3.15, we'll finish this tomorrow. Maria, can I ask you one thing? Yeah, please. Uh, you know, it, it was mentioned earlier that mm. the brain can actually be, uh, if it's a dead brain, part of the brain, if it's totally uh, dead, then you cannot repair it. Is that I don't so? know. I, the humming will have an effect. So I can't That's say that every brain, you see the brain cannot be fully dead. If a person is living, I don't see that the brain is 100% dead. Some activity is definitely going on. So, uh, 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 what I mean is that uh, when they used to call it earlier, they called it a brain dead. You know, so, the brain dead, it's maximum maybe 90% dead. Okay. So, it can be repaired. That means with such, uh, you're saying you can really do we help can, the patient. Yeah, definitely we can try. No? We can definitely try. That's all I mean. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Niket, I have uh, a question. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to know that what should be the duration of the humming? See, again, that is till you're comfortable. As Ravindraji says very well, that use the mudra till you're comfortable. Now, as soon as there is discomfort and you keep uh, doing the humming, then it is going to cause stress in your system. So that stress becomes counterproductive. So if you're enjoying the humming, enjoying doing that, then definitely do that. Right. Thank like you. So as long playing, as you enjoy I, it. I'm, I'm playing golf for four hours, right? Now, except on the tee, I'm humming throughout. Okay. So as long as you're comfortable. Yeah, today, if you see workers, mm -hmm. people who are working on the field, they're working for 8, 10, 12 hours a day on the field. And if you see in every culture, they are most of the time singing while they are uh, uh, doing the work. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it makes them energized and it allows them to do the work also. Yes. Can I add something here? Thank you. Uh, Basically, and, you can... Sir, Niket, can I access the site for humming? Like, Just one um, second. Shobha, Babi, Shimangla is saying something. Oh, sorry. What I was telling Reena was that basically what I am understanding from the reading, for healing, yes. if you hum for five minutes with the intention that this is the spot where you are sending the healing. When you're humming generally, you will not be, uh, you know, targeting the area of the problem or the where the he healing is required. So they, if you oh. remember last chapter, they said you hum for five minutes and then you stay quiet for five minutes and then you let come back to the normal this thing, you know, like, yes. so that the whole thing gets integrated. Oh, thank I mean, you. Thank humming, you with, humming with intention for healing, Intent. I think you need to do it for five minutes minimum as, as uh, they are saying but you yes. can do it for a number of times but then you have to focus your energy on the spot where you need the healing yes the intent should be there yeah, yeah. Thank Aarti, you. your hand is up yeah I would like to know the, the author of Magical Child please that's uh, Joseph uh, I'll, I'll post it on the group I'll post the picture okay. on the group. thank on you the group. thank you yeah. Th thank the PDF is also yeah. available so you can uh, read the PDF Okay, thank you. If you go in the group and you go above, in you know, you go into, when you click the top, you'll get links, documents, huh. pictures. When you okay. click the links or the documents, you'll find find it there. It will be there. Uh, hum post okay. Kar diye, we okay, reading well, thank you so much. You're okay. very efficient. Th thank you. So she's already posted it. Good for you. Arti. Thank you so much. on thank Thursday you. only. Shobha Bhabi. Is it? Yeah. yeah. On Thursday. Can Shubha I? Uh, okay. Yeah, I can wanted. Basically, I'm having very high stress levels. Mm -hmm. So, uh, can you suggest what humming I can do or any particular music I can use? Are you joining the meditations? Yes. Uh, now I'm joining. Last yeah. week I couldn't. Now I'm joining. Yeah. So join the meditations, one number one, because I find that the hemisync meditations really cool you down. Oh yeah. Uh, I think you've already registered for the workshop. Yes. 
Yeah, so Focus 10, Focus 12 are beautiful tools to be able to reduce stress. I'm sure there are many people over here who will vouch for that. Will anyone say anything? Yeah, I would Sneha like Bhabi, to say your, something. Sneha Manjula. Bhabi, yeah, Manjula Bhabi, go ahead. Yeah, Sneha just shared with yeah, you yeah. her experience. Sneha, you say something about your experience. Yeah, Sneha Bhabi, why don't you share with Shobha Bhabi about your experience? Okay. So, friends, yesterday I just did the workshop. Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Yeah, so I had the most magical experience. I went through a magic, actual magic, which I was really wondering if I should tell it to Bhaiya or not. I had a type of a cyst on my cheek. Just last week, I went to the doctor and she said, you come to me on Monday or Tuesday, we'll do a biopsy and we'll go ahead, whatever we have to do. So yesterday, while we finished the session, the last meditation when Bhaiya made us set for it, I just got a call from my doctor to say when I was coming. So I told her, how are you calling me on a Sunday? She just laughed it out and disconnected the phone. Then we sat down for the meditation. I felt it's some kind of a call. So I took it up in my mind. If this is really good and if this meditation that I've learned is really working, let me see some results. And I sat down for the meditation with Bhaiya. And during the meditation, I felt my mouth was full of some dirty thing. I had to go and spit it out. And once the meditation was over, trust me, that sister had gone. So I gargled, washed myself up, and after the whole session was over, told Bhaiya about it. So when last week, when I went to the doctor with my husband, I mean, he is the one who pulled me, dikhati nahi hai, sister, and all that. Both of us went. After the session was over, I told him, can you see the sis? He's saying, nahi hai, subha to ragar nahi thi, ab kaan gai? So, it was a sheer magic. So, I so, highly recommend. Yeah, so what she is saying is that when the body goes into a relaxed state, it can start to self-regulate. And yeah. you see, at the end of the day, what is even in somatic intelligence, Jia is also attempting to tell us and teach us the same thing. Okay. Right. Having said that, in Zia's process, you are having a, you are having a conversation with a therapist. Over here, the body automatically starts to self-regulate because of the states of consciousness that you are taken to. So there's, there's tremendous amount of relaxation which really helps in your healing process. Right. Okay. So I think you've registered for the workshop in any case. For Zia's workshop. For Zia's workshop. I really suggest after you do Zia's workshop and if you do the Hemisync program, whatever you will do in Zia's process, you it will just get enhanced. Okay. Hemisync, you mean the afternoon meditation? The afternoon meditation and the workshop that Snehbhavi just talked about. Oh, 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 okay. The one, uh, the, the Mondo... workshop. I think you've been told many times to do it. I know I missed that. Sorry. <laughs> it was my loss. No, no, not, why, why should you be sorry for me? It, yes. It's up to you. No, no, I'm sorry for my, <laughs> <laughs> my missing it. <laughs> it's happening again, so register. Yeah, I will. I will. Ravindra ji, kuch bol rahe the. Yeah. Uh, Thursday, we were discussing about the positions of the humming. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, uh, from Friday, I was trying to experiment with this two hands over here and only one over here. Yeah. So what I could understand. Yeah, I'm not here, but let's just say. Ah, bully. If I put just one hand like this, the difference is if I put both the hands like this, your saliva gland stopped during that period of humming. Okay. But after that, your saliva gland activates more. So, your digestive system gets more activated if you put it like this. Okay, beautiful. So, this last three days I have been experimenting. So, I just wanted to share. Okay, so what you are saying is... Nee, what you are saying is that these two are down, so you don't want to keep it up? No, two ears. Uh, one on the nose, one on the eyes, yeah, not exactly. on the forehead. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you just do it and they see that you're, for that time, your saliva gland stops. So you are not disturbed with your uh, humming. Uh, that uh, humming. Uh. But after that, 
your saliva production is increased during the whole day, so your digestive system becomes better. Wonderful. Great. Naak Thank you. Naak ko band kya, bhaiya? Nain, nain, naak nain naak naak band nahi karte. Band nahi karte. Uske upar rakhte. No, no. Khai. It's just yeah. It's just. Okay. Ek minute. Ek minute. Aapko spotlight kar deta hu main. Ek baar dikha diye. Ek baar dikha diye, please. Chashma nikaliye. <laughs> <laughs> you are supposed to close your nose. No, not in Brahm. Brahmi, you, you cannot hum if you close your nose. He's, unka video off ho gaya. See. Sharma, Ravindra ji ko bhaga diya. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some phone call had come. Okay, okay. Say. So, if you are putting it like this, like this, here and here. Hmm. For that time being, your saliva gland stops, and the obviously on the uh, ear, ear is the thumb. Hmm. So saliva gland stops for the time being, but after that your saliva gland starts working more. So your digestive system becomes better. Achha. I was experimenting with this and with this too. So what should we do? This is your choice. आप जो बोलते हो वही मेरे वर्क होता है अरे विच एवर वन वर्क फॉर यू बुआ वॉट ही इज नेचुरली ही सजेस्टिंग दैट पुट इट आप बिलो द लिप एंड अब द लिप यस इज सजेस्टिंग दैट ओनली एंड नोज एंड आईज ठीक है ओके ओके एनी वन एल्स एनी थिंग एंड वॉट अबाउट ये हाथ कभी कभी ऐसे दूझता रहता है उसके लिए वो तो बाद में बताए बाद में बात करूंगी Ravindra ji, please, can you can you again re-show us? I just missed it. On the thumbs on the ears, obviously. Then okay, if the, you go to uh, if you go to speaker view, he will come on the screen in your screen. Yeah. And hum this please. This will be on the upper side of the your eyeballs. This will be on the just beginning of this slide nostril. Third will be here. Fourth will be here. Just like this. Okay. Please arm. Um, please arm. Um. <laughs> humming career. Humming <laughs> career. I do humming well. Uh, I do a different practice. Uh, anybody is interested in that experience? Please do. It's a out of the world experience. While taking a shower, I do this, and the sound is totally different. It's like a Brahmana sort of a sound. Yeah. Under Ooh. the shower. So so. Now we know that Ravindra ji only hums in the shower. Yeah. Yeah. Lot, <laughs> he needs he needs the stimulation of the water to hum. Not only <laughs> falling also. on the yeah, falling on the uh, sir. Yeah, but you you mentioned that falling on the head yeah. on the top. So what is Brahmanad Om? Yes, Ma is basically. Ma is basically the sound you just. It is a personal experience. Yes to yes to. Your own sound. <laughs> Auntie, yeah. try it in the shower tomorrow, <laughs> okay. and then you can give us feedback as to what happened. हम हम try करके बताएंगे. Mind become totally blank after that. पन हम ये चंदन लगाना शुरू कर दिए भैया. चंदन लगाना बहुत बड़ा बात Niket, I can't do this till my stitches are out. Can't take yeah, a shower. Okay, after after that, what's the problem? Yeah, yeah. Yes, but Chandan's ka effect kya ho raha? बहुत अच्छा लग रहा है. एकदम cool रहते हैं दिमाग. Exactly. Great. First time हम ऐसे माथा पे यहाँ तो लगाते ही थे. रोज अभी भी लगाती हूँ. But ये वाला तो अभी दो तीन दिन से जब से आप बोलेंगे. Friday से आप बोले थे ना? Thursday. अच्छा अब चलिए. Otherwise I won't be able to render the. Recording. Meditation. Okay. So we'll see you all at three forty-five. Thank you, Bhaiya. Okay. By Thank the way, you. today we've got uh, Andrew Austin coming in. He's a great uh, gentleman. He's one of the, uh, I mean, very senior proponents of NLP. He's worked with all the creators of NLP. Uh, he's a creator of IEMT, Metaphors of Movement. Amazing character. I don't know what he's going to talk about this Gothic magic. I have not heard of it also. So let's see what happens. It should be an interesting experience. So see you all for meditation as well as nine fifty. Yes.